Are we comfortable? <laughs> Hi, it's Ray here. It's great to see you. Welcome to another fireside chat. Since the weather outside is like 50 shades of fog, it's an appropriate thing to do. This will be partially at least a bit of a follow-up on the last episode that waded into the controversy surrounding Nikon's fortunes or misfortunes depending on how you interpret the tsunami of speculation surrounding Nikon's financials. I'm guessing many of you have heard about Sony's new flagship Alpha One camera, the new perfect camera. Truthfully, I've paid scant attention to the announcement. It sounds like a beast, aimed at a very small segment of the market. But seriously, kudos to Sony for driving the technology forward. It seems to me the A1 is something like Nikon's 58mm Z mount F0.9 Nox lens, made by Nikon because it could, to illustrate what the Z mount with its huge 55mm diameter opening and short flange focal distance can enable in terms of lens design. At $8,000 US, $10,000 Canadian, the Z mount knocked is made for the few who can rationalize the expense and need its exquisite rendering. The rest of us will make do with the 50mm 1.2 just released, which by all accounts is a wonder in its own right, or even the 50mm 1.8 that I'm sticking with for the time being. All are great video lenses to boot. The Sony Alpha 1 is one of these look at what we can do products, and it will retail at $8,500 Canadian. In case you haven't seen or heard of them, here's some of the specs. It's a full frame format 50.1 megapixel CMOS sensor. It has five axis stabilization, 30 frames per second continuous shooting, dual CF Express type A SD card slots. And I trust those who are complaining about the cost of XQD cards for the Z cameras will add these, the big ones for that 8K, to the cost of the A1. And as I mentioned just a second ago, yes, it shoots 8K at 30p, 10-bit, 420, 16-bit RAW over HDMI, internally up to 4K, 60 frames per second for 30 minutes, 4K at 120p, 15 stops of dynamic range, wow. And blackout is pretty much eliminated for the birds and flight shooters. On paper, these are amazing specs that have been hotly debated online. And speaking of hotly, I wonder what temperature that 8K will run at. Sony says new heat dissipation features will take care of that. The R5, Canon's entry in the 8K video race, has been reported to suffer from overheating. I'm not going to repeat all of its features. There's been plenty of discussion since it was released last summer, especially surrounding how it beats Nikon's ass. <laughs> it retails in Canada for $5,400. How about 8K post-processing? This seems to be absent from much of the excited chatter on Facebook and online forums. My 2020 MacBook sucks, or rather blows its fans, trying to head off thermal throttling when asked to do something like multicam 4K. Okay, maybe that's a problem with Apple's design of these computers, but nonetheless, some heavy-duty processing power will be required to deal with 8K. I'm hearing hyperbole like Sony have blown everyone out of the water and more piling on about Nikon being too weak to respond. Well, no. What Sony have done, on paper at this point, is set the bar for mirrorless hybrid cameras at the upper end of the scale and price point. And hey, if money grew on, I don't know, olive trees, I'd reserve myself a copy and needed lenses and see what it, or rather, I could do with an Alpha One. But no, I'm not likely to buy one for the same reason I haven't switched, aside from my dalliance with Fuji X cameras, away from Nikon. I have a huge investment in Nikon bodies and glass, and it's also why I didn't buy a Nikon Z7, or rather that I haven't really need the megapixels lately. I still own a perfectly good 36 megapixel D800. Mind you, I'm thinking of selling that to help finance more Z gear. And the two Z6s that I've been using 
are superb, especially for video. So a lot of people, myself included, have been wondering what Nikon might have in store when it comes to a professional mirrorless body, a Z8 or a 9, as it's been dubbed on rumor sites. And I've been wondering if there's anything that I really need rather than want above and beyond the Z6s. Leaving aside for a moment what the Z2 cameras have provided over their predecessors, dual processors, less high-speed blackout, faster burst rates, dual card slots, etc. My needs are actually quite modest. I guess internal 10-bit would be nice, less need for an external recorder. And as I mentioned, 120p 4K would really be a boon for filming slow-mo over the 1080p that we presently have. Personally, I don't think shooting everything in slow-mo makes a YouTube video into a cinematic masterpiece any more than, say, applying an orange to your LUT. But it would sure come in handy for, say, smoothing out slider movements. But do you need 8K? Really, who is this for? I know it's not about making 8K videos per se. I'm not going to ask, well, what are you going to watch it on? As I mentioned in relation to the 120p option, being able to maintain a 4K timeline at the same time as using pans, crops, zooms, and other faux camera movements that's what it's all about. I usually revert to 1080p when I want those options, which is quite often, and that allows the use of the aforementioned production effects without loss of image quality. So isn't 8K the way to go as we move into the era of ultra high definition? We have a 4K TV monitor and UHD video player in the den. 4K movies and 4K Netflix content are awesome. I review my 4K YouTube videos on it. Man, I gotta work on my color grading. But 4K content is still in relatively short supply. And to be honest, when I'm watching lowly HD content, I'm not thinking, geez, this sucks. In fact, I still have a collection of DVDs that keep my attention because the films are good. Among the new 4K collection, I've got some classics like Kubrick's 2001 and Ridley Scott's Alien. Man, how can I forget seeing the premiere of that classic after a toke or two? They're all awesome grain and all. I also have The Revenant. I saw that in theaters and well, wow, what a film. What a great script. What acting. What cinematography. And the wintry locations, much of them were shot in neighboring Alberta. I remember seeing an interview with Leonardo DiCaprio where he talked about his run-in with hypothermia, which was way more scary than his tangle with a CGI grizzly. Cinematographer Emmanuel Lebeski originally planned to shoot the epic with film, but switched to digital using the Arri Alexa 65 for about 40% of the shoot. The Alexa M and Alexa XT were also used, and aerials were shot with a red epic dragon. The rental-only Alexa 65 has been used to make a lot of great films like um, The Hateful Eight, uh, Rogue One, Doctor Strange, The Great Wall, The Crowd, Passengers, War for the Planet of the Apes, and so on. The Alexa 65 has a 65mm CMOS sensor and 14 stops of dynamic range. And incidentally, Lubeski used wide-angle lenses, mainly 12, 14, 16, and 18, to shoot the film. And minimum T-stop of 5.6 for lots of depth of field. Wide aperture obsessives take note. The Revenant's source format was primarily 6.5K, mastered, of course, at 4K. The red versus airy discussion falls outside of the scope of this video, and I'm not qualified to conduct it, but I am familiar with industry chatter about Aries' more traditional filmic look compared with the red's decidedly digital visuals. And I'm more than familiar with the pursuit of dynamic range, which is often what we're referring to when we talk about a cinematic film. Again, I'm not sure that's anything to worry about too much when it comes to YouTube videos. It's arguable that 8K is future-proofing, and there's no argument that it opens up a whole new area of post-production options. But I want this chat to be relevant, I was going to say revenant, <laughs> for what should we say, intermediate content creators, like myself. 
to discuss the kind of problems we run into when making content for the web. In my case, my background is in still photography, while dabbling in video, mostly for YouTube and Vimeo, for just over a decade now. Presently, and for some time, I still have a late 2012 iMac, bought in early 2013, and a 2020 MacBook Pro bought last summer, just before the M1 MacBooks debuted. I went for the 13-inch MacBook rather than the 16-inch, which has a dedicated graphics card, for ease of travel and to save a thousand bucks or so. The iMac with 32 gigabytes of memory will handle 4K editing until I start adding effects and then it kind of bogs down. The new MacBook with the 2.3 gigahertz quad core Intel Core i7 processor, uh, 32 gigabytes of um, RAM uh, with clock speeds at 3733 megahertz, Intel Iris Plus graphics, 1536 megabytes, blah, 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 is really no better, perhaps worse sometimes, and it lets me know when I'm asking too much of it with tediously slow rendering and the beach balls of death. 8K would no doubt render it useless. Without getting into a PC versus Mac war, editing 8K video is going to tax any but the most powerful, not to mention expensive, system. So, again, who is 8K for? I don't think I'm being argumentative when I say that the average YouTuber, like me, has no need for 8K video. So what would tempt me to buy the rumored Nikon Z8 or whatever it'll be named? I don't need 30 frames per second burst speed since I don't shoot, I don't know, speeding roadrunners. 50 megapixels, I rarely print larger than 16 by 20. Dynamic range is my obsession, and it has been since I learned Ansel Adams' own system and the 80s. So I'm all eyes when it comes to improved dynamic range in stills and video, though again the latter I think is moot when it comes to compressed YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook content. And here <laughs> it might be appropriate, however inappropriate the language, be forewarned, to quote one of my favorite filmmakers, David Lynch. Now if you're playing the movie on a telephone, You'll never in a trillion years experience the film. You'll think you've experienced the film, but you'll be cheated. It's such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your <laughs> telephone. Get real. <laughs> I'd settle for 6K video. It'd be a poor man's Arri Alexa 64, which, as I mentioned, is only available to rent if you have a revenant-sized budget. I think I could deal with the restrictions of such a modest resolution, maybe even afford the storage, if I can get this damn channel monetized so I can make more than the 30 bucks a month I'm making from my other channel. So I'm not sure I could make a business case for any camera body in the $8,000 range. If you're starting from scratch, you have to budget for all the other parts of a hybrid video rig, as well as, uh, not to mention those CF Express cards. Right now, I'm much more interested in getting more glass, especially the Z mount lenses, which I've already begun to collect. In the place of F mount equivalents, they're that much better, especially for video. Let's face it, whatever the specs of today's camera body, it'll be yesterday's camera in a year or two. So you really have to have a business case to rationalize chasing every new bell or whistle. And the bell and whistle game is really what drives this brand war stuff that we discussed in the last episode. Like I said before, in so many words, uh, competition is good for the development of these mirrorless hybrids, and it's good for us prospective buyers. The most trusted sources, people like Tom Hogan, whose info usually comes from industry insiders rather than rumor sites, says Nikon is still very much in the game and will probably see a flagship Z before the year is out, perhaps as early as late spring. Its specs will have to be nominally competitive with Canon and Sony, and will most certainly shoot 8K video. It's been quite a week for Gear Freaks, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the new medium format Fujifilm GFX 100S. Its 102 megapixel sensor will record Apple ProRes RAW over HDMI via the Ninja 5, up to 4K 30p, 12 bit. Now that's not a breakthrough, 
but this iteration is smaller than its predecessors and the price has dropped by three grand. I'll leave you to look into the rest of the specs, such as better autofocus, if you're looking for a medium format camera that is relatively affordable and, again, if you have the storage and processing power to deal with huge files. Perhaps today's digital versus film debate and the reference to celluloid as the touchstone for what a film is supposed to look like is a little like the argument between the pictorialists, early photographers like William Mortensen, who manipulated their photographic prints to look like paintings, and the F64 crowd led by Ansel Adams, who embraced the stark realism of the camera lens. Standing aside, or in front of both as I've done, my take is there's enough room for both. I mean, I can appreciate the incredible skill pictorialists used to manipulate negatives with abrasion, toners, bleach, in place of Photoshop, and the beauty of a pictorialist landscape. I can savor the emotion it evokes every bit as much as, say, the sharp visions of an August Sander or Edward Weston. And here it might be relevant to mention that Lebesgue passed over diffusion filters in favor of the inherent sharpness of the Zeiss Master Primes and 16 millimeter Leica lenses that gave the Revenant its immersive look and froze the breath of shivering actors in the winter light. I know that my vision is guided by years of shooting and most importantly, printing from film. I'm looking for the kind of tonality, dynamic range that I developed in the darkroom. So of all camera developments, if some new advance could help me realize my vision, then I guess I might pay the price of admission. 15 stops of dynamic range? Ansel, did you hear the news? <laughs> Seriously though, I wanna make it clear that all these refined tools, a stop here or there of dynamic range, frames per second, whatever, aren't worth a damn without that other skill Adams talked about, pre-visualization. Knowing your tools and media well enough that you can anticipate the look you'll bring to a print or to the screen. Unless you've developed a style, a vision, how can you know what you want the camera to do? Though a camera, and these days it's algorithms and processors can open up new horizons, that's nothing new. You still have to bring your ideas to the game. What is it you're looking for? I mean, in your creative life, not on Amazon or B&H. I wonder how many of those using these specs to unleash another round of Nikon is dying predictions shoot video, even 4K. And do they know the challenges of producing it? I'm using two Nikon Zs to record this video. And though I have a single Animus Ninja 5 recorder that enables 10-bit recording, I've chosen to shoot this internally using 8-bit at 4K. But you may have noticed, if you look down below, this is a 1080p video. That's because I'm going to use that extra resolution to realize the aforementioned effects. Secondly, if you want the two angles here, matching color grading is too much trouble for a production like this. It's YouTube after all, and I'm not ready to buy a second Ninja 5. I anticipate the answer all the more reason for a camera that can record 10-bit internal. But at what cost benefit? Well, this has been a, <laughs> a wide-ranging discursive ramble, and that's how my mind works, for the second of these so-called fireside chats. I've been encouraged to reprise the format by several subscribers, so what do you think? I've created a new playlist that I was thinking of calling Fireside Theater, but I think someone beat me to it. Anyone remember Fire Sign Theater? Why, that's nothing but a two-bit ring from our crackerback jocks. You know, I remember they asked some deep questions that are uh, still as pertinent today as when I pondered them 50 years ago. And here's uh, another closing thought. These companies are making our lives so difficult. It brings to mind the Joni Mitchell quote from Bar and Grill, I think it was, the crazy you get from too much choice. If you found this video interesting or useful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel, why not subscribe? And let me know in the comments if 
this kind of format is something that you're interested in and would like to see more of. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you again soon.